The London and North Eastern Railway was one of the so-called Big Four companies, formed during the 1923 Grouping Act in Britain. In this form, with engines from the North Eastern region and Great Northern Railways, it lasted a mere 25 years, but left an everlasting impression of luxury, prestige and speed. Forty years after the end of British mainline steam, these are the stories they tell. 1952, a grim year for British steam locomotives. It was the year that the British Transport Commission proposed a plan for the modernisation and re-equipment of British railways. It was to be known as the Modernisation Plan. It was to take place over a period of 15 years and its ultimate aim was to abolish steam traction with large-scale dieselization. However, large-scale electrification on the eastern region, Kent, Birmingham and central Scotland were planned. It had only been four years since British Railways had started designing their range of standard steam locomotives. Autumn had come quickly in the year of 1952 and Stephen was talking quite gravely to one of the class fours that visited often. I tell you Stephen, the situation's bad, the class four said, looking grim. Most of us are only a few years old and they're still building us by the tens. The workers reckon we'll be scrapped within ten years thanks to this plan. Stephen sighed. Have faith, there is always another plan, another scheme. They will realise their folly when the engines line up one by one in the scrapyards and yet the workload gets bigger and bigger. Mark my words, he said with a smile. It'll take more than the government's words to abolish steam completely. If you say so, the class four said dubiously. But you'll be up first then, mate. You're, well, pre, pre-grouping. If I weren't looking at you, I'd say you're a myth. Yet here you are, a ten-wheeler talking to another ten-wheeler, and there's the best part of fifty years between us. Stephen laughed. Oh, age is no limit, he said, amused. I've come back from the brink so many times. You may not come back next time, the 4MT warned. I saw a tank engine cut up on a siding the other day, where he failed. Stephen was shocked, but tried not to show it. On the siding, you say? he asked. The class 4 looked grim. He burst one of his cylinders, and that was that, he said. You could hear the screams from miles away. The tortures were brutal. Stephen was quiet. Word is, if they think you're not worth fixing, they send you for scrap. Never mind how useful you've been or how little the damage is. The foreman shouted something to the Class 4's driver and he let off steam. Well, see you later, Stephen, the engine said. I hope we meet again. I do too, murmured Stephen, watching the Class 4 puff away. Alan arrived back home that afternoon, when the weather started to turn for the worse. Good grief, Alan said. The rain's coming. I don't envy anyone going out in this. Don't envy me, then, Stephen grunted, preparing to go. Herbert's late coming in with his stopping train. I have to take his goods train for him. Alan yawned. Be careful, Stephen, he said. I know you will be, but even so, I reckon some extra caution wouldn't go amiss. Stephen agreed, and set off to find his train. Meanwhile, on a stretch of track past the junction, a trainload of vans had been stopped. The engine at the front of the train was impatient. I wish they'd hurry up and fix the points, he said to his driver. This weather is horrible, and it hasn't even started raining yet. His driver nodded and climbed back into the warm cab. The engine harumphed. Not very talkative today, are you? But his driver did not reply, instead speaking to the fireman. Huh, the engine said. Back at the yard, and Stephen was waiting with his long train of wagons and flatbeds for his path to clear. Finally, the signal dropped, and puffing hard, Herbert arrived, whistling to Stephen as he passed. Stephen looked to his signal, which dropped and the points clicked into place. Here we go, he said determinedly, and crossed over the points onto the main line. The wind howled, and Stephen, still puffing valiantly, shivered on the cold rails. He could hardly see for the cruel, cold wind 
and just kept puffing along. The points had been fixed, but there was another problem. The brakes had come hard on a few of the trucks, and the Midland engine was not happy. Come on, he said impatiently to his driver. There's another train in our section, and we've got to keep moving. The driver agreed, and he and the fireman and the guard went along the train, checking the brakes. Stephen was speeding up on the downward slope towards the junction, and the light was dimming, and the wind blew with him as he descended the bank. He whistled as he entered the tunnel. The Midland engine heard the whistle and called to his driver. Hi, there's an engine coming. The driver looked up, passed his engine and was horrified. He scrambled into his cab and opened the regulator feverishly and the Midland engine began to move, but the train was heavy and the rails slippery. Stephen rounded the corner and saw a man waving a flag madly and then with horror saw the brake van too late. and all was silent, save for the Midland engine pulling on the remnants of his train. Alan and Sir Ralph were resting in the shed when they heard a strange noise. It was the sound of a bell, a bell that Alan had never heard before, and it had come and gone within the space for a few minutes. What was that about? Alan asked Sir Ralph, who looked grim. That's the emergency bell, he said. There's been an accident down the line somewhere. The foreman shouted across the yard, and Alan watched, mesmerised, as Nigel puffed up the line with a train of flat trucks and some workers in an old carriage. Of course, the last time I heard that, Sir Ralph said softly, the year was 1942, and, well, it was one of my brothers. They waited up all night to tell Stephen all about it when he returned. But Stephen did not come home. That morning, that dreadful morning, Alan awoke with a start, and backing down next to him was an engine he had never seen before. The engine was clearly of Midland design, and looked rather sad. Good morning, the engine said politely, and Alan replied in kind. Do you know anything about the accident? Alan asked, and the Midland engine looked worse still. Know anything about it? He said miserably. It was my train that was hit from behind, by a goods train. I've spent the night clearing the wreck up with the breakdown crew, and one of your V3 engines. Alan couldn't understand. But the only fast goods was Herbert's, he said, puzzled. And Herbert didn't make it back in time. So I heard, the Midland engine said. But the foreman here re-rostered another engine to pull the train. Sir Ralph was wide awake as well, and keeping very quiet. All I can say is, they got the poor engine on a flatbed, and took him away sharpish, the Midland engine continued sadly. But there wasn't much left. Look, they're bringing his tender in now. Alan did not want to look, but when he did, he could think of nothing to say, think, or feel. Just emptiness. For there, between two old trucks, was an older eastern tender, with faded green paint, battered and quite, quite alone. I'm so sorry, the Midland engine said to Alan, who looked away. Sir Ralph hesitated, then carefully moved forward out of the shed. Don't worry, he said to the distraught Midland engine. It wasn't your fault. Get on home, your friends will be worried. The Midland engine puffed away sadly. Sir Ralph wanted to stay and talk to Alan, but his early train was due, and he puffed out of the yard, despondent. And there, in the quiet of that yard, on a siding, stood the battered eastern tender, alone and silent. The weeks passed, and the battered tender disappeared. When exactly? No one knew, 
and nobody wanted to find out for fear of something yet more terrible. The yard had two new engines, one to stay permanently, the other on loan. The first engine was called Tavish, and he was a northern goods engine of class J39. He seemed aloof, but he was a hard-working, amenable chap, pulling the local goods trains. George was on loan from the Midland region, and outwardly was very grumpy. But he did his work without fuss, and kept Nigel company. To Nigel's delight, he was a cricket fan, and the two tank engines grumbled into the early hours, day after day, about dropped catches, bad umpiring, and bad sportsmanship. Alan found himself alone constantly and did his best to stay away from the yard as much as possible. Then one day, in early October, as the weather began to change once more, Alan found himself back in the yard, with all the engines present. "'What's going on?' he asked Nigel. "'Why haven't you all gone to work yet?' Nigel smiled knowingly. "'The foreman's given us five extra minutes,' he said. "'He said we might want to see this.' Alan was stumped. See what? he asked, but as he spoke a loud, shrill whistle blew from the junction, and everyone fell silent. Then, crossing the points, and backing towards them from out of the morning haze, a blue tender appeared, followed by a blue engine who whistled shrilly again. Alan could not believe it. Could it be? It was not, however, Stephen the Green Engine. The engine which backed down next to him, to a chorus of cheers and whistles, was Stephen, the blue engine. Good morning, young engines, Stephen said, and beamed back at them. Alan was speechless. I thought... We all thought... He began, but Stephen interrupted. It's nice to have a foreman who knows the value of a decent engine, he said. Do you like my new paint? My dear Stephen! Sir Ralph said, beaming. You look absolutely perfect. Why, I must have a wash down. And you too, Alan, he said, giving Alan a rare smile. After all, we engines that wear the express passenger blue of the British Railways must stand clean together. Oof, Tavish murmured to Stephen, rolling his eyes. Perhaps you wish you'd maybe stayed at the works.